right on uh your canvas there is a, and this is on the week three module there's a link that says review these documents so you want to make sure before before you take the quiz uh, that you look at what's in that uh link there's three documents one on uh basically IO specifications, there's a, there's a document on that. There's one on special modules, and then there's one on memory types. So I'm not gonna talk about those, but you're still responsible for the material in that link. So it's the link that says review these documents. Make sure you read every single thing on all documents and review, study that for the quiz and then for uh, the exam when we have a first exam. Um, what else did I want to say? Um, so I, I'm i trying to uh, do this, uh, keep this remote thing going. And uh, I've been in kind of a conversation with the Dean of Engineering. And uh, as of uh, what, I think Wednesday, I got, I got an email and they were discussing something. So right now, I, I really don't know what's going to happen. I don't have any information to give you for Monday. So I was going to tell you guys to just please watch your uh, announcements. Um, I don't know what they're going to tell me to do or if I should just continue doing this remote thing until I hear from them, but I'll figure it out by Sunday and I'll put up an announcement. Um, I did go over to uh, Baldwin and look at the room. Um, we're in 661 if we end up having to go face to face. So right now, um, I mean, it's my plan to send out another link on Monday, but um, just kind of watch your announcements in case things change or I decide well, we'll just go go to go on campus. Um, I was over there playing around with the camera system in Baldwin and because uh, I have another student in your class. He's in the same situation I'm in where he's taking care of his grandma, I'm taking care of my mom. And uh, so this COVID thing is, is a concern with him and with me. Um, so even if we if we go back face to face, I'm going to try to see if I can still record these lectures, um, at least whatever we can record for the people that's dealing with a situation like, like I'm dealing with or like the other students dealing with. So, um, you know, I'll give you the option, but we'll see, we'll work it out. But just point is just kind of watch, just kind of watch your announcements and kind of see what's, what's going on for next week. Um, anybody have any questions for me before we start? Questions or comments? Okay, well, I'll stick around after class if you have any questions. Um, we can talk about it. We're a little bit behind. I think we were talking about uh, we were talking about I/O, and we went through and just just kind of recapping really quick. There's two types of I/O input output, and two types of I/O and two types of uh, I/O modules. There's uh, what we call discrete I/O, and there's analog I/O. You know the term analog means continuous. Um, discrete means that the device that we're going to control or the input device can be in one state or another. So I mentioned in the last class that you might have a switch that's open or closed. You might have a button that's open or closed. You might have a motor that's running or not running. Anything or any any uh, piece of hardware that can be considered to be in one state or another is considered to be discrete. And if I'm looking over a, a, a continuum, um, then we, we're talking about analog. And I think we got through the discrete part of this, but I just kind of want to recap real fast and kind of go through here. We talked about um, the POC being bit oriented, where I can have individual bits uh, mimic the state of, of something. And anything that can be in one state or another can be mimicked with a bit. So if I have a, a button that's not closed, that's not pushed, so I have a normally open uh, push button that's open. I can represent the openness of that switch with a zero. And if I push it, if I actually close it, make contact, then I can represent that close button with the one. So that's what we mean by bit oriented. Now, remember what I said in the last class, most digital devices, practically all digital devices, except for PLCs, the smallest piece of digital information you can access is called a byte. And you remember a byte is eight bits. The PLC is a special computer in that it can actually address a, a, a particular, a, a single bit. So that's a big difference between a, a PLC and a
Are you guys back? I don't know what part you uh, missed. Let me let this reloading. I don't know what happened. This thing like just almost like rebooted or something. Well, this is the only problem with the, uh, not being face to face, right? It's that the technology is perfect when it works, but boy, when it doesn't work. But we've been pretty lucky with this. Uh, I've, I've had uh, when we first started this remote thing, but two or three years ago, it was terrible. But we've been pretty lucky. It's been working out OK, considering. Um, so I don't know what's going on now. I'm still loading these files. Okay. Thanks, Nicholas. Nicholas, you got a, uh, uh, you got a first name for your last name. <laughs> N square. We'll call you N square. I'm still waiting for these files to load up. Let me, let me, let me do something. Let's see if I can. Get this to speed up. Navarro. Yeah. Navarro is a first name. Nicholas is a first name. So we'll call him N Square. I don't know what the hell is wrong with this thing. I don't want to disconnect because then, uh, oh, Nicholas is your first name. I'm sorry. You put it in backwards there, right? Kyle looks like Navarro is your first name. Yeah. I'm I don't know. Maybe I'm backwards. Well guys, I don't know. I can't see the PowerPoint anymore, so uh damn. I'm salty. Let me see what I can do here. Maybe I'll just go to the next thing I want to talk about. There's a PowerPoint for that too. I guess I'll be working without a PowerPoint. What is the heck is wrong? Let's see. Let's try. There we go. There we go. We're back now. All right. Well, let me get to. All right. Let me shut up and get to what I want to say. I was just trying to review some stuff, but we'll just remember that the slides I want you to mark. We'll just go right to what we need. The term bit oriented, you need to know what that means. So mark that slide. And then I ask you to remember this one classification of outputs. So transistor can control DC. Uh, triac can control AC, relay can control either or. Now this refers to output modules. You can connect DC devices to transistor, uh, transistor output, AC devices to triac, and with a relay, you can control anything. So we talked about that. You don't have to mark this one, but somebody asked a really good question in the last class about the, the way the PLC modules are powered. And so we talked about, we talked about sources and sinks. So uh, just re remember our conversation. I won't quiz you over that. And when you get to the lab, there'll be some other reference material I'll give you. They'll talk about sources and sinks and ways you wire up modules. And so uh, that put us right here. So if I want to, uh, if I want to deal with devices that are, are in one state or another, I would go out and I part of the thing I part of the thing I would have to pick. You know, if you choose a PLC. You have to consider certain things. So that's one of the things you have to consider. Do I need uh, discrete I.O. or do I need analog I.O.? Well, why would I need analog I.O.? Well, anytime you have one of those physical quantities that we mentioned in past lectures, that you might want to have a quantity, an analog quantity, control or affect some, some process that, you, that you're controlling. And so since the PLC only understands machine language, zeros and ones, but the quantity that you want to to control, um, it's going to be uh, analog. Well, you have to you have to do a conversion so that the ADC, the ADC is analog to digital conversion. And typically in the PLC, an analog system, sometimes you have to go from analog to digital, and sometimes you got to go back from digital to analog, depending on what you're controlling on the output side of the PLC. And so this slide right here just kind of gives you kind of an overview, a high level view. Of the process, well, what kind of the what kind of quantities might we want to sense in some maybe industrial process? Maybe you want to sense the temperature. Maybe when uh, the temperature reaches a certain point, you want to have something happen or not happen, or maybe light. You can you know maybe you're mixing a chemical and 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 then the uh, luminous intensity of the of the light could give you some information about what's going on in a in a clear mixing tank or something. I don't know the speed pressure. 
All of these are quantities that you that you may want to measure, and depending on the value of these quantities, you may you may want your industrial process, your automation process, to be affected. And so, since these are all analog quantities, you can't enter these quantities directly into the POC. You have to do something to it. And so basically, you have to go through and you have to digitize it. This ABC example, analog to digital example, analog digital. There's an ADC and then there's a DAC, DAC. ADC, analog to digital converter, DAC, digital to analog converter. So they kind of work together. And um, this thermocouple might have a transfer function that looks like this. And so on the input over here, we're putting in temperature. And what we do is we get an output of a voltage and this is a linear transfer function this is linear and so if you have that maybe what we can do then is we can take that function and we can actually sample now this thing is kind of messed up you see right here that that staircase looking thing should actually touch the transfer function it should touch the graph right at the point like right here but I don't know what happened when I was making these. So what we're doing here, you don't really see this line right here. See that staircase? I call that a staircase. I call this quantizing. And you don't really see that square case, that uh, staircase. What I'm showing you is, is that we're actually taking samples at certain points along this linear transfer function. And so you're um, taking a sample right here. You're taking a sample right there right there, right there, right there, and you're taking these samples. And then each sample relates two things. It relates a certain voltage level to a digital code. Now, we haven't really talked about digital codes. We'll talk about, we'll mention that today. There's two types of digital information you can have. You can have a digital number, or you can have a digital code. The difference is, um, basically, a digital number will have what, what you call place value and what computer scientists call it weight. Um, a digital code, the way you distinguish uh, one piece of information from another with a code, for the most part, is by the position of the bits. And we'll talk about that here in a few minutes. So what I end up with is just a bunch of dots. So I end up with just a bunch of dots. And as you know from the first week of class, I can represent each one of these dots with a binary code, and I can store that code. So now I have information that's dig digitized as zeros and ones. So if I look at a complete process, it might look something like this, where you have a uh, some analog quantity you want to sense, maybe temperature. Well, it says here level level sensor. So I guess we're maybe the position. I don't know. We have an analog quantity in to this sensor, and then right here. At this point, we're getting a signal out. This would be a, it's a sensor, but the sensor is a type of transducer. A transducer is a device that converts energy from one form to another. And when you're in automation, typically you want to convert some physical quantity to a voltage. So just always think voltage. So uh, we have this physical quantity going on the input. We get a voltage right here. But that voltage is an analog or a copy of the physical quantity on, on the input. So we have to digitize it. So that's what this piece does. The analog to digital converter, it, it, it samples. And by the way, let me go back to this slide. There's a term here, I don't know if I mentioned, right here, rep, rep, resolution. I think I asked that, I don't know if it's on the quiz or the exam, but at some point I asked about resolution. Now, you already know about resolution if you're in the flat screen TVs or uh, maybe the, the, the uh, if you have a, uh, what you call that phone, an iPhone compared to the other. The iPhone is like the Rolls Royces of phones, the Cadillacs of phones. So the screen resolution means you're going to have more dots, more pixels in a, in a certain space, more pixels per inch or per centimeter or whatever. The more dots you use to represent information, the higher the resolution the higher the resolution. So um, I might have, uh, you know, if I sample like right here, I take a sample here and here and here, I might end up with something like this. And I can digitize each of these points. But if I sample more often, 
I can sample maybe at, you know, maybe twice as much. So I might sample here and here and here. So this one I'm drawing now is at a higher resolution than that one. The more sampling points, the higher the resolution. Now there's a trade-off. We mentioned this a few weeks ago. There's a trade-off because every one of these little points that I, uh, I made on this diagram has to be digitized. There's going to be a one-to-one a, a -one correspondence between this point and the digital code. So the more digital codes we have, the higher the resolution, the more codes you're going to have, the more zeros and ones you got to store, the more zeros and ones you got to move around. There's a trade-off to this, but the point I'm making is you should know the term resolution. So back to this process right here, we got our, our uh, analog client in to this transducer. Um, we get an analog signal here. And so this, this A, to, A to D converter is going to take that analog signal and quantize it. And we're going to end up with zeros and ones at this point. And then you got some kind of says process data. So this is actually happening in the microprocessor in the PLC. So you process the data. Um, you, uh, it looks at your program that, that you wrote. And depending on what you wrote, you want something to happen on the outside. Well, maybe the thing over here is not a motor that's just running or not running, or it's not a light bulb that's on or off. Maybe it too needs an analog signal. I have a, an actuator here. So maybe I have a linear actuator that's going to move something to a continuum. And so it needs an analog signal. So now I got to go back from digital and convert it back to, uh, to analog. So this is this and this are kind of opposite of each other. This is my analog to digital converter. If I need to go back uh, to analog, this is my digital analog converter. So I would say mark this slide and just kind of understand the process, and then we'll be good. Anybody have any questions over anything in this PowerPoint? How come you guys aren't talking to me this morning? Nobody's saying anything. Are you mad at me? Your mics are not working? Let me go to my people thing here. Everybody's, uh, I know you're out there. We're trying to, <laughs> we're trying, you're saying you can't hear. Oh, wait a minute. I wonder if you're trying to talk to me. Let me see. Maybe I got something. Why can't I hear you? Okay, somebody say something. I just turned something up. Can you hear us? All right. I don't know what is wrong. Well, guys, if you have a question, I guess you're going to have to type it to me until I figure out what's going on. Everything was working last night. I had a class and everything was perfect. So I just have to watch the screen. And uh, I don't even know if you uh, raise your virtual hand because usually it makes a noise. This makes me upset. Yeah, so Nick, Nicholas, it, it came up, but it didn't bang. So I, I, I'm going to be on the board. I'm afraid I won't see your question. Um, I don't want to reboot because then they'll end up making two videos instead of one. So we're just going to have to deal with this. I don't know what is wrong with this thing, but I bet if I reboot it, it'll uh, probably work okay. You know what I'm going to nah. All right. I don't want to waste time. So I'll try to look over at the screen. And uh, if you have a question, just try to type it out. And then on, uh, if we're, I don't know, we may be face-to-face -face Monday. If we're not, if we're still doing this virtual thing, then uh, you can jot your question down and now I'll, I'll ask. So I'll try to be as clear as I can. All right, so the next part is actually very, very important because now we're looking at how how is information stored in the PLC? Now, I know I got a couple people out there. You use PLCs. I talked to one guy. He's like a PLC expert. But uh, it really, to understand what's going on inside the machine, I, I think it makes you a much, much better programmer. And then there's certain features that we're going to use where having the knowledge that we're going to talk about now, um, you kind of can really see what's going on under the hood, and that's going to help you out in the long run. So um, let me, uh, damn, I wish I had some audio. Let me try one more thing, guys. I'm sorry. That's probably just, oh, you know what? Audio 
Wait a minute. I might know what has happened. Hold on one second. I think I know what happened. This this uh, projector. Give me one second, guys. I'm gonna shut. With that, I don't think that's disconnected. I'm gonna shut this down and try to reboot this. I'm still here. I'm just uh, trying to reboot this system and see if I can get audio. Let me show y'all what I'm doing. I guess you can see. So there's a, see that projector up there? There's a projector up there on the ceiling. And I think when that goes off, you guys can't hear me. And I had it on uh, video mute, so I couldn't tell that it went off. So I'm trying to re re reboot it, but it says the bub has to cool down. Now I got my camera out of line, so I don't know when I'm going to be out of the frame. But, well, you guys can see the room I'm in. I'm over here in this room by myself. There's snow outside. So I'm waiting for the, I'm kind of, I'm trying to stall and wait for the thing to reboot. So I'm trying to entertain you. But we'll see. Let me see if it's going to boot back up or not. Not, I guess we'll have to do it without audio. I'm going to try it again. Let's see if it's going to come on. I see some lights up there blinking, so maybe. There we go. Looks like it's trying to fire up. Hopefully this works. We'll see. Let me get back in the frame and see. This is going to be a terrible video when you go back and look at it. And say, what the heck is he doing? Come on. Uh, come on. Okay, now somebody say something. Can you? Can you hear us? Okay, I can hear you now. Thank you. But we'll see. We'll see how long this lasts. All right, so now you can ask me questions. So we, that only took like a half hour, right? Okay, so uh, I don't know. I've got my camera out of whack now. So if I, if I walk out of the frame, let me know. So what I was trying to say is uh, in the PLC, what I, I'll, I'll say PLC, but I mean any digital device, computer, cell phone, micro, whatever. Everything I'm going to say is true. And if it's something specific to a PLC, I'll mention that. You know... The only kind of uh, data or information I can have in a POC is digital information, basically zeros and ones. And so we got to look at number systems, uh, and we got to look at a couple number systems. The first one we're going to look at is called, um, well, base 10. A base 10 number system, this is called the decimal number system because that's what we use as humans. We have 10 digits, 10 toes, 10 fingers. So it's natural that we have a base 10 number system. So we need to look at this, not in detail, because we, we already understand how to use base 10. But the other one that's important is base 2, because whereas we have 10 digits, so we have the digits 0 through 9, digits 10 fingers, 10 toes, a, a computer only has 
two fingers. It can only either it's based on switches. These solid state switches called transistors and the switch can be open or closed. So we represent the presence or absence of a, of a bit of a zero or one with the state of a switch. And so since I can be in one state or another, it lends itself really well to what we call a base two number system. And so by, by means two, binary. So the binary number system, this is what you call machine language. Machine language. So these are the main two. We deal with base 10, computers deal with this. In addition to that, though, there's a base eight and a base 16. Now, these are important uh, only for, if you think about one of the terms that we talked about was byte. Remember, a byte is equal to eight bits. So since this kind of uh, lends itself to the byte definition, Base 8 is important with PLCs, and if you remember, there was something else, I believe in the last class, this thing called a word. A word. So we said for us in here, words really can be any size, but for us, a word is going to be 16 bits. And so a base 16 number system just lends itself to that. The base 8 number system... It's called octal. The base 16 is called, called hexadecimal. They call it hex for short. So we got to look at these. So I want to talk about, let's talk about base 10, because that's the one we're familiar with. So if you think about probably, I don't know, when you're in like the second grade, now the light's out. I'll tell you, I'm having a bad day today. I didn't show you the motion detector on the cylinder. So in our number system, remember when you were like probably second or third grade, you learned about place value. So you might have these places that you can have a, a number. And they told you that this was the ones place. Uh, this is the tens place. This is uh, the hundreds place. This is the thousands place. So that you, you learned about place value. And the way it works is that if you have a number, you know, you got these digits that we can use one, two, three, four, all the way up to nine. So we can use actually zero through nine, right? So I have these, these are the digits in the decimal number system. There's 10 of them. Deci means 10. So if I have a number here, like let's say I have a, a one here, a zero here, a two here, a four there. So if I have something like that, um, then what, what exactly does that mean? Well, it means that I have one of these. I don't have any hundreds. I got two of these, and I got four of these, right? So you can say that I got, I got one times a 1,000. I got zero times a 100. I got two times 10, and I got four times one. And if you if you add this up, you get a thousand, you don't get it, you get a zero there, you get 20, you get four. If you add that up, you get that thing back. Big deal, right? So that's how it works though. Well, it turns out that it's convenient to instead of writing this like this, to write it kind of as an exponent, a power of 10, a base to some power. So like if I wanted to, instead of writing the place value out, I can say uh, one, that's just 10 to the zero power. This would be like 10 to the zero, that's my one. 10 is 10 to the first, so this would be 10 to the first, 10 to the second, 10 to the third, 10 to the fourth, and so on. So I can write it like this, base to some power. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, the reason you want to do that is remember earlier in the semester, I said that when people count, we naturally start, even I did it here. I put the one there, one through nine. We naturally start counting with one, one, two, three, four. Computers don't do that. Computers start counting with zero for a reason. They start counting with zero. 
So they'll never say one, two, three, four. They'll say zero, one, two, three. So if I do that, if I write it kind of as a, a base of some power, then that power becomes the position of that particular uh, digit. So we'll say four is in the zero, zeroth position. The two is in the first position. Zero is in the second position. The one is in the third position. So we'll always write this kind of as a power and not as, as a what you call place value. Now, place value in computer science, they don't use that term. They use the term weight. So I want you to use that term weight. So weight basically is a place value. It's what you call, I guess they still call it place value. So, but here's the neat thing. It turns out that this will work for any number system, any number system. In other words, I can take and just kind of make this more general. If I don't want to use a base 10 number system, let's say I want to use another base number system. And all I got to do is basically take, take the base to, to some power and then that 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 exponent is just the position starting with zero of this particular digit so this would be b to the zero this would be b to the first this would be b to the second this would be b to the third and so on so that doesn't have to be a 10 is what i'm saying but it turns out when we're dealing with digital devices as i mentioned since computers are built with things that can be in one state or another. The binary number system is more natural than the base 10 number system for a computer. So instead of using that 10 to the zero, 10 to the uh, second and so forth, the computer is gonna work like this. This base right here is gonna be two to the zero, two to the first, two to the second, two to the third and so forth. So if I make this really, really, really general, when I have a number system, so I have B that stands for base. And the N, of course, is the power, which is going to tell me what position I'm in here, starting with zero. And uh, the base tells you how many symbols are in that number system. So earlier when I had the base 10 number system, you can write it like this, 10 to the N, where N is zero, one, two, three, and so forth. But the 10 means we have 10 symbols in that number system. So you want to remember the base tells us the number of symbols or digits in that number system. Base 10 is going to have 10 and then 0, one, zero through 9. If I have a base 2 number system, that means I'm only going to have two symbols. And you know what they are, 0 and 1. If you take the base minus 1, the base minus one, it tells you the value of the highest digit in the particular number system. So uh, a base two number system is gonna have two symbols. And if I take two minus one, then one is gonna be the value of the highest digit in that number system. So you don't, you don't just have place value with base 10, you can do that with any base. You can make up your own number system. We might even do that on the exam, I don't know. Computers use this number system, a base two number system. So instead of having like we had the, the ones, the tens, the hundreds, the thousands in the base 10 number system, the computer is going to think like this. It's going to have a two to the zero here, which is a one, two to the first, which is a two, four, eight. And then base two is kind of easy because if, if I keep going that way, these values just keep doubling. So I go, uh, you know, what, 16, uh, 32, 64, 128, 256. I can go on and on. Just keep doubling as you go to the left. So now this is the place value for a base two number system. So let's say uh, this is called the binary number system. And what you got to remember is, even though we think in base 10, Computers only think in base two. Humans base 10, computers base two. So what that means is, let's say you bring up your, calc your cell phone, you bring up your cell phone and you use it as a calculator and you enter 12. If you enter 12 onto the screen of your iPhone, now since we got other number systems, it's customary at this point 
we got to spec we got to specify which number system we're in. And so you'll see me do this. I'll put a 12, but we're going to talk about several number systems. So this is 12 base 10. I won't do it right now, but at a certain point we'll subscript this so we know what, which base we're in. But the point I'm making, I don't want to miss the point. The point I'm making is if you're on your cell phone and you're in a 12 or one, two, you're in the number 12, and you hit enter into your calculator, whatever, whatever it is you're doing with the 12. When you hit enter, a 12 doesn't go into the, the uh, microprocessor. What goes into the microprocessor is you got an eight, you got a, a one, I got one of these, that's an eight, I got one of those, that's a four, I don't have a two, I don't have a one. So if I add up uh, eight and four, that's 12. So a one, two, a 12 in our number system, the computer sees this. That's a 12 to a, your computer, your cell phone, your whatever. This is binary, this is decimal. Um, when you have a binary number, the leftmost bit position is called your MSB. You want to write this down. That stands for most significant bit. The most significant bit. And then over here, this is a LSB. That stands for least significant bit. So you want to know the most significant bit and the least significant bit. And one of the things you got to be able to do is given a decimal number, you got to be able to write it out in binary. Now, uh, I don't know if I can share. Let me see. Let me get off of here for a second and show you. I want to. I want to know if you can see my screen. I'm gonna try to. I don't really know a lot about this stuff. Let me see if I can share my screen. Uh, I want to show you the calculator. I don't know how to do this. I think I might get a echo. Can you see my screen? No, we can't. Can't see it. Maybe I have to show you another time. Let me try one more time. It says entire screen share. I don't want to share a window. I think if I share the window, it's gone. Well, what I wanted to show you, yeah, I don't know how to share the screen right now. I don't know why that's not working. But what I was going to show you, I'll try to figure it out next time. The calculator, there's a calculator in Windows, and I'll, I'll show you. You can, you can check all your work in that calculator. Cal I don't want you to cheat because there's a worksheet you're going to work out with these number systems on it. But you can use that calculator to check it. I'll try to figure out how to share the screen, and I'll, um, I'll show you how to use it next time. But um, so one of the things uh, you, you want to do, just make this little box. It's called 8, 8421 code. Just make a box like this, and we'll just do four bits right now. And you know the place value or the weight in binary. This this is base two. This would be a one, a two, a four, and an eight. So whatever number I want to give you, if I gave you something like this, one zero zero one, this is my base two number. I got to multiply the digit by the weight and then add all the ones up to get the decimal equivalent value of it. So what would this be in decimal? Nine. Yeah, so a, a nine on your cell phone, when you hit enter, it goes into your microprocessor like that, like that. And I'm going to show you, we can do everything you can do in base 10, like add, subtract, multiply, you can do in base two. Um, so, and you know, remember, it doubles. If I give you a bigger number, this just doubles, and you can still play the same game. So one of the things you'll be, you need to be able to do is to convert uh, uh, decimal to binary and vice versa. So I just make this little box right here, and I can just figure out. I always start with the largest one. So if I gave you, uh, I don't know, like when we did 12, we came over here to the 8 first because there's an 8 in the 12. So I know I need an 8, and then I need a 4, so everything else was a 0. So start with the, the leftmost, the biggest weight first. And then another way to do that, though, is called divide by 2. 
it's kind of well it's not really hard let me show you what that is divide by two i think i use the number 47 in the slide so you can take a number and keep dividing by two and if you divide out by two the remainder becomes the bit now you got to remember though you got you know if i have a binary number then, then this one over here is my most significant bit and then this is my least significant bit so when you do that divide by two method the first remainder you get is your LSB. So let me show you. I think I got enough time to show you that, and then we'll probably be out of time. So if you want to, you can use an 8421 code. With the divide by two method, what you do is you take the decimal number that you want to convert to binary, and you just keep dividing it by two, and then the remainder becomes the bit value you're looking for. So if I divide, say two goes into four, two times, two goes into seven, three times, uh, 23 times 2, that's going to give me 46. And when I take the difference, that's the remainder I'm talking about. That remainder becomes your first bit. But you got to remember, using this method, that's going to be your LSB, your least significant bit. And then what you do is you just take this. You keep dividing until you can't do it anymore. So then if I do the next one, I take 23, divide by 2, uh, goes in 1 there. One there, I get 11. I double that, get 22. I get a remainder of one. So my next bit is a one. You just keep doing that. I take 11, divide by two. That's going to be five. That's a 10. Again, I get a one. So I got a one, a one, a one. I take five. Divide, well, let me do this up here. I take five, divide by two. That's going to be two. Let's give me a four. So I got one. I got two. I got two divided by two. Two goes into two one time. One times two is two. Now I got a remainder of, of zero. And then now a lot of students make a mistake. They stop right here when they get to that one. You got to go, when you get to that last one, you think you got to go one step further. Here's a, I'll say it out loud. I want to take the one. I'm going to take the one, this one, I'm going to divide by two. Two won't go in the one, so I put a zero here. Zero times two is zero. When I do the difference, I get a one. So this bit right here is my most significant bit. That's my MS bit. So as long as you kind of follow what I did and you start that out as your LSB. So what I have is that's my MSB. So I got a one, zero, one. Let me put it right here. I got a one, zero, one, 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 one. And so I think if you uh, if you use your place value in binary, this would be one, a two, a four, a eight, 16, 32. I got a 32. I think if you add these up, you'll get 47. So that's called, if you look that up on uh, YouTube or whatever, wherever you guys go to, that's called the divide by two method. I think I like the box. I just make the little box. And mainly, usually the four cells will do everything you need. The eight, I call it 8421 code. And you can just kind of put your bits in there. So usually, this will work out. Sometimes you got to go over to 16 or 32. But for the most part, you can do everything with that. But that's that's another way you can you can convert over. I'm trying to, oh, I still got five. Well, this class is over at 10, right? Is it right at 10? I think it's over at 10. So let me show you one, one more thing. And uh, this will be a setup, a good setup for us on uh, Monday. Anybody have any questions so far before I've been talking? I haven't gave you a chance to ask any questions. Any questions before I jump into this last topic of the of the day? Okay. Well, we actually have one problem when we're dealing with binary numbers. Negative numbers. If you think about it. What I like to be able to do is take, like, we can take a, a 12 in our number system, and we know the computer is going to see that as a 1100 zero, zero base 2. That's a 12 to a computer. Well, what if I had a negative 12? Well, you say, all right, Ron, just write, write it like that. Well, you can't do that. You can't do this because the only thing that can be inside of a microprocessor that exists inside of a digital device 
is a one or a zero. You can't put a minus sign. There's no space for a minus sign. So how do you, how do you represent a negative number in the digital device? And that's a big problem. But it turns out there's two, there's three ways to do it. We're going to look at two ways. One way is to use what we call a, um, a sign bit. The other way is something called the ones complement. I'll just say ones comp. And then there's another kind of similar. It's called the twos complement. So I'm going to show you in the in the PowerPoint. Uh, I guess when I recap on Monday, I have all of this in the PowerPoint. We'll kind of go through it. I'll show you the sign bit. I just want to show you the ones complement and the twos complement. Now you're going to look at that and say, well, okay, I don't see how that's a negative number. Don't worry about it. When we get to, when we actually use this, because the next step is, okay, I understand how to re uh, represent numbers in binary. Well, how do I do math, like arithmetic, arithmetic in binary? You don't have to know that to be able to use a PLC. But I want you to know what your digital device is doing. I think I think it's it's, it's some some learning there that I think it'll be good for you. So um, th these are real simple. So the ones complement. All that is is you take the number and you flip the bits. You take the number and you flip the bits. The twos complement is kind of a process, so I'll show you that. I'll just take me a second to show you. So these are all, these are three three different ways to represent negative numbers in uh, digital devices. So the ones complement, let's say I start with a binary number like this. Well, let's just do 12. Let's just do that. So there's my binary number. If I want to take the ones complement of it, every place, every place I see a zero, I make that a one, and where I have a one, I make it a zero. So the ones complement of this number, this will be zero, zero, one, one. This is the ones comp. And again, right now, don't worry about how you use this or why it's negative. Just know how to do it. So that's the ones comp. Ones complement, real easy. Just strip the bits. Two's complement. Now, if you go to YouTube on the two's complement, they're going to give you a different way to do it. They're going to tell you to take the one's, the one's complement of the number and then add one to it. So you got to know how to do addition, which is pretty simple. But I do it another way. For the two's complement, what you want to do is start on the right and go to the left. And you keep all the bits up to and including the first one. Up to and including the first one. And then you take the ones complement of everything after it. So if I want to take the twos complement, I start on the right, up to and including the first one, they stay the same. I'm going to leave those the same. So this will be a one, zero, zero. And then you take the ones complement of what, whatever's left. So I got a one left. I take the ones complement of that. That one becomes a zero. So this right here is the twos complement. If I can say twos. Now, what we're going to be able to do with this, I'll show you next week or next class. I want to see, all right, okay, it's one thing to store numbers in a microprocessor in binary form. I think you probably followed what I did today. Well, how do you, when we say we process data, what the heck does that mean? And how to, pretty much everything you do is mathematical in a device like that. It's, you're either shifting bits or you're adding, subtracting, all the, so how, how does that happen inside of the microprocessor or PLC? So that's what I want to explore next time. But to do that, you got to know how to handle negative numbers. So we'll talk about that in the next class. I think I'm out of time. So, guys, you have a great weekend. I almost wrecked my car. I was uh, I was in the driveway, and I was trying to back in so I can pull out easy, and I just kind of slid into this wall. I think I, I, I think I, I hope I hit my tire and not the side of my car, but I was too pissed off to check it, so I never looked at it. So stay safe. It's slippery out there. I'm going to stick around. I'm, this is the only class I have today, so I'm going to stick around in case people have questions. But uh, feel free. Uh, you guys are done, so take off. Just want to remind you to uh, I'll open up the quiz. I think since I'm finishing this material so late, I'm going to leave the quiz open. Well, maybe I'll open it up earlier. I'll leave it open. I don't really like leaving it open past class. Uh, sometimes people want to ask questions about it, but I'll try to get it open as soon as I can. <laughs> But just remember to read that link and, and that says uh, review these documents. If somebody says something. Kyle, Kyle, you have a question? Oh, Kyle left. Does somebody have a question?
Okay, I'm just rambling. So guys, have a great rest of the weekend, and I'll stick around in case somebody has questions. Nobody has questions.